causal inference and causality in health and health sciences. So the first question that we would like to ask is that who are the people who use causality? And the answer, of course, is that everyone. Each one of us use causal inference and cause and effect associations in our lives in many different ways. You know, those of us who are ordinary people, we use it in everyday life. Although we often conflate cause and effect uncritically and uh, we often mix up the causes and conditions and we'll talk we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. The lawyers and judges use that all the time in order to create a uh, in order to um, arrive at decisions about defending their clients or um, you know passing judgments about who is responsible for certain moral occurrences in the society. They use abnormal or unusual patterns of occurrence from normal occurrence um, to explain um, uh, you know um, actions of people. Philosophers use it all the time to explain the world and as scientists, engineers, epidemiologists we use this all the time for our own purpose. So there are different ways in which people use the notions of cause and effect and we will review some of these here. Well, why do we need to study causality? Because we spend a lot of time in our regular lives, professional lives, practical lives, looking for causes. And what's very important is this, that cause, causality or causal um, inferences have got other names uh, that goes by other names, determinants, risk factors, causal associations, these are all synonyms. Computers have become very powerful so that you can actually now crunch large amount of data and uh, therefore it's very important that we should be able to establish uh, causes from non-causes, causes from mere correlations. We just saw in our previous exercise that sometimes things are correlated but people conflict that with causes. So let's take a very quick look at how philosophers from time, uh, you know, from the beginning of time have started looking at it. In the beginning there was scholasticism, so you would have a guru or, or a scholar who would pronounce uh, certain things, uh, you know, X causing Y and people believe that. This was soon challenged and we, then we came to that point of what is known as inductionism, where you observed particular events and then people from those particular events from generalized theories which were then applied to um, uh, you know day-to-day -day, um, um, activities. Then came the idea of deductionism, falsification, and refutationism. These are the new ways, or these are the ways in which inductionism was challenged, and this is how we, uh, in the 21st century, are um, uh, figure out causes uh, and events and causes and conditions in our modern time. And from there rose the idea of hypothesis testing, which is a cornerstone of correlations and causal, causality uh, literature. So in induction theory, which was um, whose um, biggest proponent was John Stuart Mill here, um, the idea is this, that you observe a specific event, and then from that specific event you frame a general theory, and then you apply it to particular circumstances. For example, for example, Edward Jenner, who was the um, 18th century English um, doctor, and uh, he observed that, uh, you know, milkmaids who used to milk cows and often get cowpox would not suffer from smallpox. So from there, he came to the conclusion that cowpox conferred immunity to milkmaids. And he used this to actually inoculate his son and that's how the whole world, the, the, the science of immunization began. Even though nobody was, uh, nobody knew at the time uh, anything about the germ theory of disease or how or the microscopy of these various um, microorganisms, but that worked. And one person who did not, uh, who, who took the next step from inductionism was um, David Hume. And um, David Hume, he's David Hume, he argued that, you know, induction lacked logic. And he argued that induction is actually based on an assumption that the pattern that you observe today is going to hold true for forever. But that may not be true or that may not have any, uh, any logical basis at all. So, for example, one of the problems of the inductive logic is things is often referred to as problem of post hoc ergo propter hoc. 
that means that if something happens after this therefore it must be happening because of this simply stated if x is true uh, then y is true as well and that's what we observe so if y occurs then x must have occurred and this is a also often referred to as a fallacy which affirm the consequent i'll give you an example um, it's often observed that um, whales are stranded on a beach and that event uh, uh, sometimes is followed by an earthquake somewhere on earth or yeah, in new zealand or somewhere else so whenever earthquake occurs whales are found to be stranded on the on the on the beach maybe a week before and at one time whales were found stranded on on the beach last week um, so that may mean that okay it's going to we are preparing to we are, we are going to brace for an earthquake well that's a problem because there may not be much of an association between wells getting stranded on the beach and event of an earthquake but that's how people um, people go and you some of you may remember the theory about the supermoon and earthquake and that kind of things so Karl Popper um, came up with this so uh, th there was a problem with um, with, with, with this world of uh, inductive logic and therefore um, you know from inductive logic arose the world of deductive logic and the cornerstone of deductive logic was given by um, the Vienna School of Philosophers and uh, one of the, the, the biggest proponent of that was Karl Popper. He also um, had taught at this very university, the University of Canterbury. And Karl Popper had a theory which is referred to as a theory of conjecture and refutation and he, and, and he stated that science advances by a process of elimination. And that elimination basically means that you start with a number of different theories, a num number of different theories and hypotheses, and test these hypotheses to eliminate, to find out as to what's the best hypothesis that's going to stand out. And that's known as the theory of conjecture and refutation. So, Karl Popper said that scientific hypotheses can never be proved as true and therefore this also holds true for causality. You can never prove a cause. You know, you cannot say that, you know, X is definitely the cause of Y. You can only suggest. There can be any number of alternative hypotheses. The hypotheses themselves are mutually inconsistent, but yet they um, explain the same observations. Therefore, as long as the observations and hypotheses are consistent, then it does not prove that the hypothesis is right. But if you can find one observation that is inconsistent with the hypothesis, then you should reject that hypothesis and move on to the next one. This is known as falsification of hypothesis. So therefore, for the same phenomenon, you start with multiple hypotheses. And those hypotheses can be based on your intuition, conjecture, previous experience, anything. Then use that hypothesis to predict the state of the world. And then you test with the observations that you make in the real world. And you hold the hypothesis as long as your observations match with your hypothesis and predictions. But the moment you find a contrary example, you reject that hypothesis. This was the... Um, the, uh, the concept of Karl Popper's uh, idea about conjecture and refutation. So as we, as we move along, uh, one of the central reasons why we are, uh, we, we are interested to study hypotheses and um, refute hypotheses, look for more observations, is because we want to really find out um, cause. And cause, um, was given by a, a good definition of cause was given by Ken Rothman and this is Ken Rothman and Rothman uh, defined cause as a specific you know either disease or event uh, which is an antecedent event or a condition or a characteristic that was necessary for the occurrence of a very specific incident of a disease or health outcome at the moment that it occurred given that other conditions are fixed. So let's break it down slowly. So first of all, cause of a disease or a health outcome should be either an event, a condition, or a characteristic. Second condition, 
it must precede the outcome. And then if cause were absent, that is if you would not find the cause, then the disease would either would never have occurred or would have occurred much later. So there are four basic, basic conditions. It has to be event condition or characteristic. It must precede the disease event. And if the cause were to be eliminated, then the outcome would definitely be eliminated. This was the point that um, Ken Rothman made. But what is the nature of cause? You know, uh, philosophers Hilary and uh, Rousseau um, talked about causes being intangible. You can't really hold cause. You know, you, you cannot observe cause physically. I mean, it's impossible to establish beyond doubts. So these various different things that we think of causes can work not as one amorphous whole, but more like a mosaic. And cause is deterministic. Cause work as mechanisms. So Hilary and Rousseau argued that there are five problems where we actually apply our notions of causality. The first problem is that of um, testing of hypothesis and causal inference. The second one is prediction. Would you like to predict the world? The third is that we would use causality to explain the world as to why certain things occur. The fourth one is we use cause in order to control certain conditions so that we can design um, you know, interventions or you know, policy making. And the fifth one is reasoning. In other words, we would really like to make sense of this, um, of this big broad world. So inference is, a, is, is, is probably the most canonical problem of cause and effect. So if, if, if we talk in terms of cause and effect causality, we always talk in terms of causal inference, right? So inference is the prototype uh, that's most important here. Does X cause Y? What are the causes of Y? What are the effects of X? How much of X causes? How much of Y? Prediction is more like what will happen. So what will happen to human health if the climate changes? How many people are going to die next year? What do we know of them? When is going to be the next flu outbreak? Explanation is things like, you know, how does cancer lead to death? You know, if we all know that physical activity leads to heart disease, how? Okay, so it's kind of how questions. And control is, okay, we know this, that X causes Y. So what are we going to do about it? So how can we use X to control Y? X causes Y, so what? Okay. Keep these things in mind as we start uh, looking into the different causal variabilities. And the reasoning is like a broad overarching concept where we say, okay, what are, are, are our assumptions in building a scientific model? What is this notion of cause and effect? So the way to do that is that in all these cases, we have to frame a hypothesis, then we have to gather data, and then we test a causal hypothesis. So what are the different ways in which we gather data? Well, one way to do that is to set up experimental methods. So we set it up and we control the conditions. There may be quasi-experimental setup where nature sets up everything and then we observe them. Or there could be purely observational methods, epidemiological studies. We can also do simulations. If we know some mechanical factors as if we are going to build up Lego blocks and we are going to uh, simulate things. We can also do qualitative study. So all sorts of different ways in which we can make sense of the world. Experimental study designs in healthcare and in particularly for human health is uh, most commonly is randomized controlled trials, CRCTs. And there are two concepts that are central to experimental study designs. One is that we should be able to manipulate conditions and that we should be able to have random assignment. So we should be randomly able to distribute people into different, different groups and we should be able to manipulate the conditions of the studies. The first um, you know, historically recognized randomized experiment was in psychometrics by Pierce and Jastrow in 1885. Uh, in agricultural studies, it was Fisher and Neyman in 1925 um, started the first randomized experiments in agricultural sciences. And in medicine, the first RCT was um, 
the study of streptomycin for tuberculosis in 1948 by uh, uh, Sir Austin Hill and other people were involved in it. It was a big team that went for this. But we must understand that experimental study design has got some, some limitations. You know, the most important limitation is this, that you know, there are ethics of research that we have to follow. And, uh, you know, for example, we cannot study cigarette smoking and lung cancer even if we are convinced that that is a relationship. We cannot just take people and ask them, randomly assign, and say, you must uh, smoke cigarette and we're going to watch when are you going to develop lung cancer. We can't take another group of people and say that you're not going to smoke cigarettes and we'll see and watch you forever. That's, that's not going to happen. You know, this is unethical. On the other hand, when we start talking in terms of causality, we can observe by natural experiments of what happens to these people. This is, this is where quasi-experimental study designs come into the picture. Again, they're very similar to randomized control trials, but instead of human beings controlling the conditions, we let nature control the conditions. For example, you know, if you are interested to study behavioral outcomes of children who are exposed to natural disaster, say for example, earthquake, then you know, once an earthquake occurs somewhere, then you start developing cohorts of students and then compare them, or adolescents or maybe children, and then compare them over time how their behavior change. That is not a study that you set up, nature set it up, and you started observing them. That's quasi-experimental study designs. There are many different kinds of observational study designs, purely observational study designs. For example, cross-sectional survey. These are the studies in which you study the outcome and the exposure all at the same time. Uh, a good example is census. And you get a snapshot of um, everything that happens in, in, in time. And you, and you can get a sense of that. Then we have got cohort studies. And cohort studies are studies where we take well-defined individuals who are called cohorts, referred to as cohorts. For example, exposed cohorts and non-exposed exposed cohorts. Then we follow them through in time, and then we observe how, over time, they develop specific health outcome. There are case control study designs. And in case control study design, we take people who have the disease, who do not have the disease, and then we follow them, or you know, we we retrospectively look at to what was their um, what, what was their ex exposure. In some ways, they're like a randomized control trial because there are controls, but um, you know, other than that, these are purely observational studies. Case series are essentially qualitative studies where you take cases and you follow these cases uh, or you know, describe these cases as fully as you can. But note that none of these can establish causality. You cannot establish causality because the best that these studies can do, even experimental studies, is that they can establish correlations. So um, we need some more evidence and more reasoning to move from um, correlation to causation. And then there are other groups of studies. For example, qualitative studies where you check small groups of people. You're very rigorous and you do with, um, you know, you, you, you take interviews or you go and live like them and then you try to find that out. Very important. And then there are simulations which actually you mimic the system of interest. So maybe, for example, you build Lego blocks and then put them to certain strain conditions and see how these things are going to behave in this. People build wind tunnels where they make experiments for aircrafts, things like that. Uh, they're not really very useful in case of uh, epidemiological studies, although in silico experiments and mimicries, always done simulations are done in genetics and genomics. So how do we interpret the results of these studies? We have to assess internal validity. That is, um, can we have confidence in the results as they're presented? Can we extend the results of these studies to an external population? That is external, external validity. And what is also important is this, whether we can, we can think of that there are alternatives or alternative approaches or alternative explanations to what we get to see. This is the heart and soul of how we validate a study design or a validate a set of conclusions. So internal validity tells us as to what is our level of confidence in the findings of the study. The, the study findings must be coherent, 
they must be plausible, they must be convincing. When we assess internal validity, we ask ourselves, okay, are we testing a causal structure? So if we are testing the, um, the internal validity of a, of a hypothesis uh, testing study, Okay, is there a reasonable thing to say that okay, there is a cause and effect association between these various factors? Are we testing that? But when we are interested to take that explanation to other situations, then we're going to test what is known as an external validity. So we take those findings, can we apply it to, to other people, other situations? The most important thing to understand here is this, that a causal association must be internally valid. If it is not internally valid, then you cannot talk in terms of cause and effect association at all. At best, uh, there can be some sort of a correlation, but even that correlation is not substantiated because that's not even a valid association. Only when something is uh, something uh, is, is, is valid as an association, then you can move from that association to test whether the nature of that association is causal or not. And the other thing which we need to think about when we think in terms of validity of that association is this, that you know, we must make sure that the chance was ruled out. So we need to take a look at the p-values, we need to take a look at the confidence intervals and convince ourselves that, okay, I am confident that they ruled out the play of chance. We must be confident that the biases were eliminated, you know, selection biases, response biases and so that the measurements were done on the comparison groups in the same way so that you know the results would be comparable truly comparable and we would have to um, be confident that the in the study design um, you know there was not a third variable that could explain both the outcome and the exposure as you can see in this particular diagram a confounding variable is one which is related both with the exposure and the outcome. So when you find an association between the exposure and outcome, um, it might be because of the confounding variable, but not always apparent. So that's very important, it can be hidden. And so the exposure variable causes the outcome, but actually it is a confounding variable that is linked to both of these, and therefore is a play of this as opposed to this. Okay, maybe this causes this causes this. So that's something that needs to be understood. How can we be sure, confident, that investigators control for confounding? Ex ante, that means before the study, they can you know, match, this, match the cases and controls or match people on their age, gender, potential confounding variables. They can restrict people. So now they say that, okay, look, you know, they would say take only certain age groups, certain populations. Uh, they would eliminate some groups. In the previous study, for example, these people eliminated uh, those with disease conditions. Or randomize. So randomized controlled trials in randomization is a process that takes care of the unobserved confounding variables. Following data collection, uh, they can do multivariate analysis or they can do stratified analysis and they can they can analyze data in various strata. And um, so that's how you can control for confounding variables. So one person who made a very significant contribution to this um, whole um, science of um, causality which kind of moved the ideas of from you know hypothesis testing to valid associations to the notion of whether something is of cause and effect is sir austin bradford hill he was an english uh, a professor epidemiologist and statistician and he did something along with uh, sir richard doll that showed that it was cigarette smoking was you know the causal factor for lung cancer and what Sir um, Austin Bradford Hill did was that he came up with a set of guidelines, often um, often mispronounced uh, as Bradford Hill criteria. And these are like, there were nine criteria that you need to commit to memory almost. The first of that is strength of association. How strong is the effect size? The second of them is consistency. Are the findings consistency consistent across the subgroups in which the study were done? Or are these, are these findings consistent across the populations in which these studies are conducted? Is it specific? In other words, are these uh, cause and effect associations kind of map onto one another? 
Is it temporal? In other words, do the cause precede the effect? If not, then you can't really think in terms of causal connection. Is there a biological gradient, which is also similar to what is known as a dose response gradient? If you increase the dose of the cause, does the effect correspondingly increase? Is it biologically plausible, given what we know about the biological activities, can we mechanistically explain that association? This is not always satisfied. So, but at least the first four criteria, the strength of association, consistency, whether that association is very specific to the causes, and whether there is a time-bound association are very, very important. The next five are important, but we need to understand them um, with a pinch of salt. Although we can get an experimental evidence, it is not always possible, particularly in epidemiological study settings where you can't conduct experiments. Tissue experiments might be useful. Analogy, are there similar examples that we can cite to suggest that, okay, this is the case. The reason why these are guidelines and not really criteria is in uh, the own words of Sir Bradford Hill, that what I do not believe, and this has been suggested, is that we can usefully, fully lay down some hard and fast rules of evidence that must be obeyed. Uh, and before we accept cause and effect, you know, none of my nine viewpoints can bring indisputable evidence. These are viewpoints, and therefore, at the best, these are guidelines, not really criteria. Pitched against this was uh, the thesis by Russo Williamson where they said that, look, you can take the Bradford Hill criteria and you can divide it into two groups. One, they thought there was difference-making approach, like you can make comparisons and then on the basis you can say that, okay, look, you know, if these comparisons get satisfied, then there is a causality. So it's a little bit less, uh, a more liberal take on Sir uh, Bradford Hill's nine criteria. You can break them down into two uh, or four, depending on how you want to do that, or the production approach. So the difference-making approach, for example, would be like, you know, looking at the strength of association or whether the findings are, are consistent, whether you can biologically, uh, there is a gradient exists in terms of, you know, their, the different levels of cause and effect, and whether there is some experimental evidence that you can cite. Whereas a production one, in other words, how causes produce the outcomes, you'd look at specificity. In other words, whether cause and effect are kind of linked or can be mappable one onto the other. Is there time-bound connections? In other words, you know, does the cause really precede the effect? Can we have a biological mechanism of production that we can explain? Is it coherent with other findings? Are there, are, can you find an analogy so that we can say that, okay, this is how it produces the effect? So based again this, if we come back and think in terms of what was John Stuart Mill way back when claimed, and his idea was that, look, you know, um, when we talk in terms of cause, we cannot talk in terms of a one single cause. They have to be more than one causes, put in the form of a mosaic, for example. So he said that cause is the sum of total of the conditions that are both positive and negative. Okay, so some causes will increase the occurrence of a particular outcome. Some causes will decrease the occurrence of an outcome. So given that there can be multiple causes, which is more important than others? And that's something that's very, very important. For example, let's take up the case of Port Hills fire. You know, last month there was this massive fire in the Port Hills region. And, you know, the jury is still out as to what caused that Port Hills fire. Is it that the hot and dry conditions, that was alone? Maybe a Norwester kind of wind that came over? Was it accidental? Was somebody lighting a, a, a fire there and accidentally the wind came along and everything worked together to form? from the fire, we just don't know. But, you know, these are some of the conditions, uh, things that we should uh, think. Again, for example, what causes lung cancer? Is it smoking alone, weed and gas, asbestos and arsenic, genetic combination of everything? This is the idea of the component cause model. So we say that, look, you know, a cause is not a singular entity, but more than one factors merge together to uh, form causes. And three people, uh, you know, three groups of ideas that are very important. The first one is by Hart and Honoré. Uh, second one is by Mackey. And the third one is by Rothman. We'll take a look at this. So Hart and Honoré's ideas are used quite frequently in tort law and legal circumstances. 
and uh, the causes and conditions are different in case of law. So for example, what happens in law is this that, um, you know, they kind of use that everyday notion of causation. You know, X causes Y, the last straw breaks the camel's back, that kind of a situation. But causes are not conditions. For example, if you take the Port Hills fire example again, so somebody was lighting a fire and then a breeze came along and that led to the bushfire that the fire spread. There's so a breeze is a condition because that's a normal thing that happens. Maybe the hot temperature is also perhaps normal for this time of the year. You know, temperature, you can't do much about it. So they could not be con cause, they, you cannot legally say that they were the causes of this fire. So if the police or a jury or investigative party goes out and tells us that, okay, it was the breeze that caused the fire, or if, if, if this was the um, hot conditions that was the cause of that fire, that's not going to hold up in a court of law. But if we could find out somebody who was doing something mischief, which is not a usual thing to do, then that would become the cause in a legal sense of the term. Now that was what, um, that was what... Uh, Unknown caller. And that was what um, he was trying to. Um, uh, that was the that was the problem of um, that was the problem of hot and honorary. That was the thing that hot and honorary tried to um, tried to um, emphasize in their studies. So the next thing, which is very important here, is the notion that that um, that. Um, there's something that's normal versus abnormal. So the oxygen is normal, which is always present. Breeze is normal, but maybe human activities are not normal. Something, um, you know, how we think in terms of climate change, for instance. So in contrast to that, Mackey came up with an idea that you could actually have a more conceptual analysis of the, uh, of the nature of the causations, the different components. You know, some causes are um, necessary, some causes are sufficient, and that's very important. So now we touch upon a condition which is known as INAS, insufficient but not redundant, part of an unnecessary but sufficient condition. So let's take a look at that uh, in a minute. In order to get a sense of that, we need to understand that there are certain things, certain kinds of causes that are necessary, unnecessary, and sufficient, sufficient causes. So a necessary cause is a cause which must happen for that effect to happen. For example, infection to cause tuberculosis. Okay. On the other hand, if somebody were to cut off another person's head, that decapitation would be enough. So that's a sufficient cause. Okay. Shooting into somebody's head to cause death, for instance. So INAS refers to insufficient yet non-redundant part of an unnecessary but sufficient conditions. So for example, in lung cancer, you know, smoking by itself is insufficient to cause cancer. You have to have some other conditions. It could be genetic conditions, it could be rate on gas exposure, any number of things. They will cause cancer. But we also know that smoking causes certain tissue changes which will lead to cancer. So as lung cancer can occur due to other conditions, you might say that smoking by itself is unnecessary. But if you add smoking and then tissue changes, they form a sufficient conditions. So smoking plus tissue changes are sufficient condition to cause sm um, cancer. Smoking alone is an unnecessary part. So therefore, smoking becomes uh, an INS kind of a situation. But you need to understand that not all causes meet INS conditions because say for example HIV virus for AIDS. This is a necessary condition for it to occur. Otherwise AIDS will not occur. Tuberculous bacilli for TB. Shooting at head for death. That's a sufficient condition. So it's important. The reason why INS is important is because if you can find a necessary condition then you can prevent diseases or you can treat diseases if you can treat the necessary conditions. So which is why the causal field or the background in which we discuss the cause and effect becomes a very, very important thing uh, to discuss. Which was the point that Ken Rothman 
um, made is this that you know we need to have a practical approach to have um, to discuss uh, causality and the fact that disease is caused by multiple factors there are sufficient causes there are necessary causes and there are causes that are component so this is known as a component cause model so Rothman's concept was this that um, you know all causes are kind of component causes and um, you know these components are components of a sufficient causal model in a sufficient causal model what happens is this that these components are these components of a sufficient causal models are such that they're just barely sufficient there's a minimum conditions so for example if you have got a b c d and e this is a sufficient causal model each one of them as you will see are kind of components of that sufficient cause model if a were to appear in each one of these circles then a would be a necessary um, cause but it doesn't appear in this case of course but all of these are individually what is known as a sufficient cause model and he wrote this paper it's an excellent paper that he wrote in 2005 to explain this so this is it you know this is called a uh, Rothman's pi or component causal model pi so each circle is a sufficient cause model each slide slice indicates a component cause and the components of course do not add up to 100 percent may add up to 100 percent may add up to more than 100 percent and this is a deterministic model okay each constellation of the component causes are minimally sufficient that they have to be there we cannot have another they, they cannot be a redundant or an extraneous cause that that are left and each component is a necessary part of that specific causal mechanism like you cannot take out a and you cannot close this loop okay and uh, you know a b f g h they together form the loop and form the sufficient cause these are all necessary for this and each of these are known as complement of the other one so b c d and e would be complement of a b f g h would be complement of a or a would be complement of h you know and so on and these causes interact amongst each other so let's move on to an example to show how causes interact so you can see that you know this is a situation this is a hypothetical case where uh, people with head and neck cancer were uh, smokers and drinkers. They're both smokers and drinkers, the rate would be 12 per 100K. And if they were only um, drinkers but non-smokers be three, if they're smokers but did not drink before and so on. So what proportion of head and neck cancer is attributable to smoking? You can see 75%. So there are 12, which is because of both smoking and drinking, three because of uh, drinking alone, so smoking is because of 9 per 100K. So 9 out of those 12 cases would be attrib attributable to smoking alone. And so this is a 75% attribution. You can work that out and you can see that 67% would be because of drinking alone. And you may wonder as to what's happening. If you add them up, they become 142%. But that cannot be. Yes, it can be because there are these people who were both smokers and drinkers. So we will explain this in details and uh, there, there are uh, things. So individual component causes, um, you know, individually they cannot exceed 100%. But the sum of them can be more or less than 100%. So they can be joint action of many causes. And many causes will be left over after you have explained quite a few of them. What proportion of disease is caused by the component causes? In this case, we've got three uh, sufficient models. UAB, UAE, UBE. If we asked you what proportion of disease is caused by you, the answer would be 100% because without you, none of this disease is going to happen. Whereas with A, it causes uh, in, in two situations. B causes disease in two situations. So their contributions could be quite different. So what fraction of disease is caused by should be, um, E, for instance? E is responsible for two of these sufficient causal models. But you, that is 100%. 
This is known as uh, causal coaction that the different components act together with each other. Like injury to head caused loss of equilibrium at the age of 40 years. Then this person suffered um, you know, a, a fall and lost balance and his, her, his hip broke at the age of 70. So head injury would be contributing to this. What can icy path would be contributing to it? Lack of hand railings would contribute to it. Fall would contribute to hip fracture. So the, then the question was this, that, you know, if we know all of these component causes and the sufficient causal model and things like that, this is all on a population basis when we talk in terms of epidemiology because that's the science of, of populations. The problem is whether and how to use information of general causation and bring it down to, um, to individuals. Like Bob, for example, is a regular smoker but otherwise leads a healthy life. So what can we do? to translate public health knowledge to personal choices. Is it okay to advise that you're not going to smoke or you're not going to drink because you can uh, come up with something else? This is a difficult question to answer. So Cain Waters is a philosopher and um, he did something which is known as the actual and potential causes based on these new kinds of studies called GVA studies or genome-wide association studies. So say for example, there are two potential loci for Alzheimer's disease and there is one gene called GAB2, which is a potential cause of Alzheimer's disease, and X develops Alzheimer. Maybe GAB2 may be the actual cause of the Alzheimer. So the actual cause is something that happens on an individual level. Potential cause is what happens in the population level. Most of the times we deal with population causes. And therefore, when we uh, take things that are true for population causes and then extrapolate to individuals, we are committing a fallacy which is known as ecological fallacy. On the other side of this coin is if we take studies that are exclusively applicable to the individuals and then extrapolate to whole populations, then we commit a fallacy known as atomistic fallacy. So how do we reconcile problems of individual versus aggregates? We use multi-level models because they help to reconcile like, you know, okay, between individuals and populations and aggregated measurements and they kind of help us to find a middle way and of course when you do um, multiple um, multi-level multi models you cannot have an a priori reason that you prioritize one level over another which means that you can't say that maybe the region is more important than the time period or maybe the region is more important than the country and things like that so this was a very whirlwind and fast tour of the most important notions of causality and we will be exploring this um, further. Um, if you've got questions, I'm more than happy to answer those questions. Remember that causality is by different people in different settings. Lay people use it in one sense. Lawyers use this in another sense. Scholars use this in, in yet another sense. And we use the scholarly approach. Remember that it is impossible to prove cause beyond reasonable doubt. To establish that X causes Y, you must make sure that the association between X and Y is a valid association. Then check for Austin Hill guidelines. An easy way might be to look in for uh, Williamson Russo thesis to see which one of them at least minimal to help us getting it then. But even then you cannot establish causality, you can only suggest it. And it is okay to work with incomplete evidence because you have to use uh, the causal linkage and evidence that you get into your real life.